Welcome and thank you for standing by. Currently, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be posted publicly. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn the call over to your host for today, Anna Owens. Hi, hello, and welcome to another one of our um, webinars for our data series, Administrative Data, Data Toolbox. I hope you've been um, joining us for some of our other webinars, which includes some data, um, Administrative Data 101, um, a discussion about the um, Census Bureau, the U.S. Census, and the population estimate. So we've had some great discussions. Um, this um, session is focused on strengths and weaknesses of administrative data. So thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'll give a quick overview in case this is the first um, series that you've joined with us. And um, we'll be taking some questions at the end of our session. Um, to ask a question during any time of the session, we would like for you to use the Q&A feature. Um, this is different from the chat feature. The chat feature is for us to communicate to you one way. The Q&A feature allows us to get your questions. If you don't see the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, there's three little box, three little um, dots. If you'll click on that, the Q&A feature does appear. Um, and whenever you submit your question, please submit to all panelists so our team will be able to grab your questions so we'll be able to answer them later. As mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and we'll be able to make it available for you on our website for future use. So I think we are ready to get started. Um, the first thing I'll do is introduce our team that's with us today. Um, Keith Finley is an economist in the Economic Reimbursable Surveys Division at the Census Bureau, where he uses administrative records to increase the quality of federal statistical products. He co-founded the Criminal Justice Administrative Record Systems, or CJARS, a data infrastructure project for the next generation of statistics and research on the criminal justice system and population that interacts with it. He received his PhD in economics from the University of California, Irvine. Next, I'll introduce Carla Medea. She is an assistant division chief at the business development in the Economic Reimbursable Surveys Division at the Census Bureau. She leads a team of innovators who leverage data science methodologies and novel data sources to improve the way the Census Bureau collects, produces, and disseminates data. She joined the Census Bureau in 2012 and holds a PhD in Sociology and Demography from the University of Pennsylvania. Next, I'll introduce Nicholas Ferris Carre. He is an Assistant Center Chief for Demographic Research in the Center for Economic Studies here at the Census Bureau. Nicholas leads an interdisciplinary team that uses administrative data and quantitative methods to research improvements to household survey and decennial census operations and data quality. The group also researches how administrative data can be linked to data collected by the Census Bureau to create novel experimental data products providing the American public with richer information on the nation's people and economy. Nicholas holds a PhD from the University of Washington, Seattle. And our final panelist is Sonia Porter. She is the principal sociologist and demographer at the Center for Economic Studies here at the Census Bureau. Sonia's research focuses on racial and ethnic measurement, identification, and identity, and using linked data to conduct research on racial and ethnic inequality and mobility in the United States. Her research interests also include using linked administrative records and census data to study correlations and determinants of intergenerational and intergenerational mobility to answer key questions related to educational policy and to study social and economic pre- and post-incarceration experiences of former incarcerated individuals. She received her PhD and master's in sociology from the University of Maryland. So welcome to our esteemed panel. In this webinar, we're going to focus on strengths and weaknesses of administrative data. We'll begin by discussing why statistical agencies have increased their use of administrative records. Then we'll explain why the Census Bureau is allowed to acquire and use administrative data. Then we'll walk through specific strengths and weaknesses of administrative data. For each strength and weakness, we'll discuss specific statistical applications here at the Census Bureau. So I think 
Kate is going to begin our discussion. Thanks, Hannah. Statistical agencies around the world have been increasing their use of administrative data for decades. People face more distractions and claims on their time than ever before, so it's not surprising that they're less likely to respond to surveys. This decline in survey response rates, which is happening across all types of surveys, is one of the big motivations for the Census Bureau's increasing use of administrative data. As response rates have gone down, the cost of conducting surveys has increased substantially, and the quality of survey data is potentially at risk. Administrative records hold a lot of potential as a lower cost source of information about the American people and its economy. And as we'll talk about today, administrative records also allow the Census Bureau to create new information products never before possible. So I think we're having a little trouble here with Carla's connection. We're gonna see if she, we can reconnect. I'm Maybe sorry. I'll take the slide and, and Carla can try to call in. Yes, thank you, Keith, that'd be really great. Thank you. So um, the Census Bureau's use of administrative data is authorized by federal law and controlled by a comprehensive data governance infrastructure. Title 13 of the U.S. Code authorizes the Census Bureau to acquire and use records to the greatest extent possible so that we're reducing the respondent burden uh, to households and businesses to engage in reimbursable studies and joint statistical products so that we're doing things at the cutting edge of science, to protect confidential individual and business data, limit access to data, and only allow those data to be used for statistical purposes, swear in researchers to assist the Census Bureau, and <clears throat> punish individuals for the wrongful disclosure of, disclosure of information. The Census Bureau maintains a data governance infrastructure that includes systems and standards of data stewardship, the use of anonymized data only within secure computing environments, and rigorous review of statistical material before disclosure. Thank you, Keith, for um, jumping in um, and our audience for some technical issues. I think we're gonna get Carla um, connected very shortly. Um, so we ha had some, we're gonna learn a, a, a bit about some of the benefits of administrative records. And um, so I'm gonna ask, um, Nicholas, if you could start the discussion. Sure, I think the benefits of, of administrative records is a really important topic. And I think there are a number of benefits related to administrative data. One benefit is that we can use administrative data to help ensure that our survey and decennial census data is as accurate and representative of the population as possible. For example, the Census Bureau uses information from the U.S. Postal Service to make sure that we have the most up-to-date list of all residential addresses for the nation. We use this master list to select addresses, often using statistical sampling methods to be included in a Census Bureau data collection. An accurate list of addresses is important as new homes are continuously being built and older homes are being taken down. Also, addresses can change from being used for residential to business purposes and vice versa. We wanna be sure that our master list of residential addresses accurately reflects the addresses at which the American public resides, so we can be sure that our data collection efforts best reflect the nation. I think this is one really important example, how I'm sure others on the panel have other additional examples as well. So Nick just made some important points about administrative records and the American people. Um, it's important to note that administrative records um, also ensure that Census Bureau products are representative of the American economy. The Census Bureau conducts the economic census and related surveys to measure economic activity in the United States. Um, we use business tax data from the Internal Revenue Service to make sure our economic surveys cover the ranges, range of businesses in the United States. Um, business tax data are used to identify all businesses so that businesses in all regions across all industries are represented equally. Thanks, Sonia. As I mentioned earlier, administrative data have been used at statistical agencies for decades. And we have a number of success stories at the Census Bureau that we're really proud of. For example, the Trade Indicators Program at the Census Bureau is derived from trade records collected by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Trading companies submit import and export records to Customs and Border Protections as part of their normal business practices. The Census Bureau uses those records to generate detailed statistics about the volume and value of international trade with the United States. Those statistics are in turn used by the Biz Bureau of Economic Analysis to create estimates of gross national product. In this case, administrative records have been used, for, used successfully for decades and there are no survey alternatives to comprehensively measure international trade. 
So, Keith, I think we have Carla back on. I think we're still trying to get her connected, so sorry. We're going to have to um, maybe we'll continue and then loop back with Carla. Sure. Um, so, Thank administrative you. data can be used to improve the quality of survey data. Sometimes survey responses are less accurate than administrative records. The Census Bureau has found that household respondents are less accurate in their reports of food assistance and retirement income. The Census Bureau can use administrative records of food assistance from state agencies or retirement income from the Social Security Administration to validate and possibly correct survey responses about those topics. Thanks. Those are really great points, Keith. They make me think about how administrative data can help with data quality issues that arise when individuals or households do not complete a survey or the decennial census when they're asked to do so. This is an important point, as you know that generally, survey response rates are declining, including Census Bureau surveys of households and businesses. Further, even if a household or person completes a survey or the decennial census, they may not answer all of the questions. Earlier, I noted how important it was that we had an accurate list of all addresses so we could make sure to include households in a manner that was representative of the nation. In a similar fashion, we need to work so that all or as many as possible of the households selected to respond to a survey or decennial census do in fact respond with information for all questions. If non-response impacts operational costs and very importantly, data quality, administrative records can help address some of these issues. We can use administrative data to aid in supplementing information if someone forgot to answer a survey question. For example, if someone forgets to include their sex or date of birth, we could look to see if we have that information from an administrative data source, and if so, we could use it to help to fill in the information that the respondent forgot to include. Also, for the 2020 American Community Survey, or ACS for short, we used administrative data in the creation of the survey sample weights. The administrative data helped to account for the fact that the population that did respond, that did not respond to the ACS, likely due to the COVID-19 pandemic, differed from the population that did respond. So building on what just Nick covered related to survey and response, administrative records can also reduce uh, costs for uh, particular data collections. So when administrative records are used as an alternative to survey collection, the cost of producing information products can be substantially reduced. For example, uh, uh, we recently released the Non-Employer Statistics by Def Demographics Program, which uses individual level tax data, business data, and also Census Bureau demographic data to create demographic profiles of small business owners. The program replaced a survey collection that was costly, was burdensome to respondents, and also took a long time to produce. Sonia's example is another case where administrative data can be used to improve surveys. We'd also like to, to talk about how administrative data can be linked with other survey or administrative records to create new information products that provide insight on the American people and its economy never before possible. Sometimes neither survey data nor administrative data paint a complete picture of a segment of the population. In these situations, we can link administrative data to survey data to better understand characteristics and patterns. One example where we've done this kind of linkage involves the Criminal Justice Administrative Record System, a data infrastructure project to collect and harmonize administrative data from state and local criminal justice agencies. These data are linked with other survey and administrative records to better understand how the criminal justice system functions and who interacts with it. In the figure you see, administrative records on felony conviction were linked with W-2 information returns from the Internal Revenue Service to identify the employment rates of people convicted of felonies. The colored lines show the percent of people employed in the years after they were convicted of a felony. To provide some context for these statistics, the gray line above also shows employment rates based on the same type of tax data, but from a sample of American Community Survey respondents who had not completed a high school education, but did not have criminal records. This context helps us understand how low employment rates are for people who have been convicted of felonies. It's a great example where administrative data and survey data can be used together to provide a rich picture of the experience of the American people in a way survey data alone aren't capable of. Okay, I'm gonna try take three. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Welcome Woo! back. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what was happening there. Did not have We're happy you're back. Time. <laughs> okay, so apologies for that, and thank you, Keith, for pretending to be me. Um, you did that so well. Um, so I'm also going to talk about how administrative data can enable timely and high-frequency information products. 
Um, so a great example of this is the business formation statistics program that you can see here up on the screen, where you can see monthly business applications um, over the last many years, including a spike during the, in applications during the pandemic. Um, the business formation statistics program is an economic indicator which measures business initiation activity or business births, as we like to say, among other topics. Um, it is constructed from applications that businesses make to the internal revenue service to obtain tax ID numbers, which are administrative records. Um, these statistics are produced at a monthly level and cover the universe of all business applications. It wouldn't be possible to collect these same data from a survey um, because, first of all, we wouldn't have the administrative, without the administrative data, we wouldn't know um, which businesses to even survey to contact, um, but also because it would be much too burdensome and cost prohibitive to collect this information from a survey. That's a really interesting graph, Carla. On a related note, and kind of on the, the person side of the house, we can also use administrative data to better understand eligibility and participation in state and federal programs. As part of a joint project with the Department of Agriculture, the Census Bureau acquires data from state agencies on SNAP and WIC program participants. We developed SNAP and WIC eligibility and participate uh, estimates of SNAP, SNAP and WIC eligibility and participation by linking state data to ACS data at the individual level. Information from the ACS is used to estimate who is eligible based on the program's eligibility criterion. We've developed data visualizations, which are published on census.gov, that display these estimates for SNAP and WIC. A screenshot of the SNAP and WIC data visualizations are shown here. These visualizations allow users to see state and county level estimates of SNAP and WIC eligibility and participation for selected states and years by various characteristics. These screenshots do not do the data visualizations justice. So I'd encourage everyone to visit census.gov to further explore the live and interactive version. Note that we're, all, we're always working to add data for more years and for more states. So if something you're looking for is not there, please check back again soon. Hopefully we'll have it. But I think the key point here with this product is that by linking together our program participation and ACS survey data, we can identify whether eligible people are enrolling in these public uh, programs. And we could not create these estimates if we did not have access to the administrative data. However, with these data sources and our linkage in infrastructure, we can create new high value statistics. So Nick just highlighted the benefits of using administrative records data for cross-sectional analyses, um, and, but administrative records can also help us measure long-term outcomes. Uh, we can link administrative records data at the person level, family level, or business level to measure how circumstances that happened years ago or even decades ago um, impact current outcomes for, for people or families or businesses. Um, so for example, the Opportunity Atlas uses tax data linked to decennial census data as well as survey data to measure social mobility in the United States at low levels of geography by parental income, race, and also sex. Um, it would be too expensive to collect the information using uh, surveys, uh, and respondents have a difficult time remembering events that happen years before a survey. Um, moreover, it would be really difficult to develop estimates at low levels of geography without the administrative records data. Um, note here that the uh, survey data is also really critical because we need to um, be able to get the, inf the demographic information from the survey data. So I'm going to walk through uh, a couple slides of the uh, um, Opportunity Atlas. So the first slide here uh, shows incarceration rates for Black men who grew up in low-income families in Los Angeles. And what we find is substantial variation uh, in um, outcomes uh, across tracks within the same counties, and then also children's outcomes vary by tracks that are just a few miles apart. Um, so what we see here is that 44% uh, of Black men who grew up in the lowest income families in Watts um, are incarcerated on a single day, which in this case for this product is April 1st, 2010. In contrast, we see 6.2% of Black men who grew up in families with similar incomes uh, in Central Compton, 2.3 miles away from Watts, were incarcerated on a single day. We also find that there's substantial heterogeneity in mean track level um, outcomes across groups. So places that have good outcomes for some groups don't have good outcomes for other groups. And this next slide right here uh, makes that point well. Um, so in contrast to the patterns that we just observed for black men from low income families um, in Watts, we see that Hispanic men who grew up in Watts 
have an incarceration rate of 4.5%. Um, so what's important about this data product, and it really allows this combination of administrative records and survey data, allows researchers and policymakers to really address these differences across subgroups and also at low levels of geography with, with, with much greater precision than they're able to do with survey data alone. Wow, thank you everyone for, for sharing some different data products that were created using administrative records. So I'll highlight to everyone, we were putting the links to those specific products in chat. Um, I'll also take the time to note, if you have questions, just remember to put them into the Q&A feature. Um, we'll loop back to some questions when we finish our discussion. Um, so I was hoping we could go ahead and start the discussion about some challenges when working with some administrative data. I think Keith, you're gonna kick us off for this one as well? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, thanks, Anna. So while we're excited about all the opportunities administrative data provide, the Census Bureau conducts a lot of research to determine how they can be used to produce high quality statistical products. One of the aspects of using administrative records that's challenging and a topic we study is how characteristics of people or businesses might be measured differently in administrative data versus survey questions. If administrative and survey data measure a topic differently, administrative data may not be appropriate to substitute for survey data without additional analysis. For example, the concept of disability is measured differently in the American Community Survey than in administrative records from the Social Security Administration or the Department of Veterans Affairs. To understand these differences, we might link people who report a disability in the American Community Survey with administrative records of disability to measure to better understand how the measures are different. Um, okay, thanks, Keith, for giving that. So another example um, that we wanted to talk about a challenge to using administrative data is that households and families may be defined differently in household surveys and in administrative tax records. So for example, both administrative tax records and household surveys measure income, but incomes from the two sources may not be directly comparable. Um, so for example, households or families are defined you know, differently in these two different data sources. While the Census Bureau surveys um, identify households based on people residing together at the same address, in tax filings, families are defined based on their marital status and relationships with respect to taxes. Um, so therefore, when the Census Bureau is going to use individual tax filings to help measure family or household concepts, we must um, pay a lot of attention to those different de um, definitions and adapt those concepts to coincide with our survey-based measures. That's a really good point, Carla. I think another thing that we need to consider is that surveys may be more flexible and facile than administrative data when examining new and emergent topics. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Census Bureau initiated the Household and Business Pulse Surveys to take the temperature of the nation's people and economy. For example, questions in the Census Bureau's Household Pulse Survey can and have been quickly changed to reflect current and emergent social and economic topics. Recently, new questions were added on the ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities due to experiencing long COVID, changes in transportation behaviors due to the cost of gas, infant formula access, and changes in behavior due to increasing prices. So if there is a need for information in a timely manner, there may not be administrative data readily available covering these emergent topics, or it may take too long to produce timely and useful measures that rely upon administrative data. Thus, I think it's really important to think about the benefits of the varying information collection methods and their capacity to accurately answer questions of interest in a timely fashion. Another challenge with working with administrative records is that some people are less likely to show up in administrative records than others. So just like there's hard to count populations in surveys, um, Census Bureau research has found that not all people are equally likely to be represented in administrative records data. Um, so the Census Bureau conducts research to identify the types of administrative records data it needs to acquire to improve coverage of, of uh, the American population. Um, and we continue to acquire these types of data to fill in these gaps um, so that we can continue to provide high quality data and high quality data products. Another area um, that where we've been conducting research is also uh, related to record linkage. And we found that uh, with record linkage, there's also different groups that are impacted by, by these processes. And so this research is really critical because it can help the Census Bureau determine how to best improve the rec our record linkage systems and also our processes to help represent uh, all people better. 
as Sonia mentioned, it's important for us to continue to acquire administrative data so that we can measure the American people and its economy accurately. But it can be costly to acquire administrative data, especially those collected by state and local governments. Many public programs and institutions are overseen by state and local governments. Nick discussed data we collect from state offices that administer food assistance programs, for example. Acquiring administrative data sets and building data infrastructure that covers the entire country is complex and expensive. Projects like these take years to develop into national data sets, but they are key to the future of federal statistical programs. Wow, so it sounds like there's tons of promise. So we saw some great um, different products. Um, we've talked about some areas of opportunity within administrative record. record. So I'm going to ask if each panelist will give us a final point on what you want to leave today with, and then we'll dive into some of the Q&A. Thanks, Anna. The context for this discussion is that survey responses have been declining, and that's led to higher survey production costs and potential decreases in data quality. I'd like to remind everyone that the Census Bureau is required by law under Title 13 to use other data sources to reduce the burden that our surveys have on households and businesses. Administrative records allow us to improve the performance of our survey operations and increase the quality of the products we release. I think this is increasingly important given the rising levels of survey non-response. Uh, administrative records allows the Census Bureau to produce new products about the American people and the economy that were never possible, uh, that wouldn't be possible just using survey data. And we gave a few examples like the Opportunity Atlas or CJARS um, or other things related to SNAP or uh, also businesses. And I think this is a really critical use of the data. Um, another point that I think is important to make to wrap up is that there are challenges with using administrative records data, as we all highlighted, um, but the Census Bureau is working really hard to address these challenges as we increase our use of these data. Thanks, Anna, for facilitating this discussion. Oh, well, thank you. It's awesome to have a, such a group of experts on administrative data in one session. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, ask a few questions. And then I will also um, let people know we're still taking questions if you want to submit them through the Q&A feature. Just remember to send it to all panelists so we can um, get that question um, elevated to the team. But let me go through a couple of them um, that we got. Um, one of the questions is, what are some data gaps in administrative records? Um, I can, yeah, sure. I'll speak to one of those data gaps. So um, one of them has to do with health-related data. The Census Bureau does have some data from, for example, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services about both Medicaid and Medicare, um, but there's still not nearly as much um, health-related data as we would like to be able to answer some really important questions about the health of the nation's people and economy. Um, so one example that we're trying to fill that gap is the Census Bureau's eHealth program, um, which is seeking to acquire um, administrative records from, you know, health utilization about from hospitals, et cetera, um, so we can link those data to the other data we have and see um, the health of the people from a more holistic perspective. I think another area where we could, uh, there's a bit of a data gap is in educational records. I think if we could continue to get access to educational records, we can better understand and better measure levels of educational attainment at a number of, of levels at kind of high school and then post-secondary. And also for the younger population, I think educational records are really helpful and they can help us to better understand and potentially measure the extent to which there is an undercount of, undercount of younger children in the population, as this is a known issue in our survey and decennial census uh, data collections. Um, a, a part of our survey operations that uh, where there's potential data gaps and where, where, where we're uh, working right now to, to make improvements is in our group quarters collections. So group quarters are uh, housing units that don't necessarily house families, so it could be prisons, it could be dorms, it could be nursing homes. And um, in each one of these, these are areas where we could make improvements in terms of enumerating people and measuring their, their characteristics. Um, in each one of those categories, we may have, you know, we're maybe in the process of identifying um, administrative data, for example, uh, for prisons. Uh, um, in other areas, um, we're, we're looking for opportunities, uh, for example, with, with dormitories. Um, but these are areas where uh, we could potentially improve our, our survey operation significantly by, by finding out administrative records that could identify these folks and, and uh, potentially shed light on their characteristics. On that note, I'll say one of the questions that we got was, why can't we just replace surveys with administrative records? I think that dovetails a little bit into the data gaps, but 
would love to hear your thoughts on everything. So as we've discussed, there's different strengths and weaknesses um, of both surveys and also administrative records data. Um, but sometimes administrative records data don't have all of the information uh, that are collected in surveys. Um, and then also sometimes the concepts um, or the data uh, between administrative records and also the surveys do not align or the coverage is not sufficient. Um, and then lastly, as Nick had pointed out earlier, that for emergent or sometimes timely uh, topics, uh, administrative records are, are sometimes not available. Um, but there are times uh, where we can combine all of the necessary information from administrative records. And as I had mentioned before with NSD, um, that was a really good example of something that was able to, we were able to replace a survey because we had the necessary administrative records data to do so. Thank you. Um, one other question that came in while we were chatting, um, in addition to, the, to some of the data gaps that we, we talked about with our first question, um, what are some additional examples of data gaps in surveys that are well covered by administrative records? I think that's, that's a good question. I think one area where I think administrative records are really helpful is in questions around migration and trying to um, you know, track patterns over time. I think Sonia, when she was talking with Opportunity Atlas, talked about issues with recall bias. And so I think often when we look at surveys of migration or um, people making a lot of life transitions, I think administrative records can potentially more accurately measure some of those transitions in a way that, that recall bias may, um, may induce some error in a, in a survey data collection. And I guess another example, building off of what Nick just said, um, so, you know, administrative data on program participation can be of quite high quality because you're getting the data straight from the source of the, the agency that administers the program. You know when they enrolled and what their benefits were, et cetera. Um, but just to, you know, a counterpoint to that argument is that the survey provides more context for that person and that family or whatever, or that business. So you'll have more information about you know, their age and other demographic characteristics and where they live. And so it's, you know, really useful to put these two things together to get the most, you know, um, full picture of what's happening. Uh, I mean, all fascinating um, um, advances and understanding. So thank you everyone for, for kind of going through that. Um, another question that came in is, um, we've, we've mentioned before that young children have been historically undercounted in surveys. Um, but they show up more in administrative records data sets. Are there examples of other groups where this is the case? So uh, one example we've kind of touched upon a few times in, in, um, in the presentation is are, are people that have been involved in the justice system, whether that's trying to enumerate them while they're in a justice facility or potentially uh, once they've uh, rejoined the civilian population. And um, in both cases, we might be less likely to pick them up in surveys Sometimes it's it's expensive or it, it can be just uh, um, difficult to to get our enumerators in in those justice facilities or outside. These be, might be people that are um, have residential instability or potentially are homeless. Um, and so there we can potentially use uh, administrative data on the justice system to to have a good sense of kind of the, the overall population of who those people are and whether or not at any given point in time, whether we think that they're in a justice facility or outside. Totally great example. Didn't even and think about that. Anyone else want to chime in before? I think we have another question lined up as well. We can move to the next one. Um, what are some examples of challenges you've had with record linkages? I can talk about that. Um, so, you know, we do record linkage at multiple levels. I think it's important to set that um, stage first. So you can link people at the person level, you can link at an address level or an organization level, for example, governments or businesses. And for each of these cases, we have different methods that the Census Bureau uses to match people to, or businesses and addresses, um, to, you know, some kind of reference file that allows us to be able to link across other sources of data. Um, so in order to have those linkages as high quality as possible, it really requires high quality PII or BII, et cetera. Um, and so, if, you know, for example, if you have um, an age as opposed to a date of birth, that's going to be slightly less high quality linkage. So the more, you know, detailed information we can have and the more accurate information we can have, the better job we can do to link the data across um, all the different sources we have. 
Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent point. Um, just making sure I didn't, no one else wants to chime in on that one. Um, the next question I have coming up is, um, what are some opportunities or research of using administrative records that you're excited about? This is a little bit of a personal question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll hop in here. Um, I think there's there's a lot of work that that I'd want to using you do using administrative records. I think when you think about the data collection lifecycle, we can use it probably across the data collection lifecycle to um, in ways to improve our, our our data collections and our operations. So I think the two areas where I'm at present most excited about using administrative data are to aid in sampling and to data collection. I think that we can really build upon our current work at, at Census to further integrate administrative data into our sampling or household, or household selection methods so we can more efficiently uh, and effectively include populations of interest in our surveys. So for example, we've done some work on the National Survey of Children's Health where we use admin data to identify whether uh, an address at which we think a child lives is, is in fact present and um, then based upon the kind of the, the admin data that we have, uh, we're able to essentially kind of uh, look at our households on a continuum of more likely to less likely to have a child so that um, we can then essentially more, uh, more efficiently uh, contact households with kids so that we can, we can more efficiently do the survey and uh, there's less burden on the American public. Also, given the rising cost of data collection and the rising levels of response, I'm interested in further understanding how we can use administrative data to help inform decisions around data collection strategies. So if we need to make a difficult operational decision due to cost constraints, we're making those decisions in an optimal way. This will allow us to control costs while doing our best to protect data quality and ensure that our respondent population is representative of the nation's people and, and households overall. Then obviously I think a lot of the data products that we saw today, the examples are an area where I think we can continue to do good work in a lot of high value statistics. Um, I'd like to add something that's sort of a little bit different. So I'm excited about all potential uses of administrative data, but um, administrative data as defined are collected for the administration of programs, right? And so they're not collected to do research with them. They're not collected to do this evaluation necessarily. So one thing that I'm really excited about is the possibility of changing how we collect administrative data to enable them to be better used for evidence-based decision-making. How can we maybe do some small tweaks to how we collect administrative data, not to prevent the administration of that program, but just to allow us to better link those data to the other data that we have and to better use them for all kinds of um, research projects and evidence-based decision-making. So I think that would be really exciting as well. So for me, I think I agree with both uh, Carla and Nick. Um, but something that's sort of important to me and is very near and dear to my heart is I work on a lot of um, data products and research that relates to vulnerable populations with a specific focus on race and ethnicity. So I work, um, um, uh, you know, looking at um, linking evictions data uh, to data housed at the Census Bureau. And I think a, a question might have come in related to race and ethnicity data, and this is actually a great example, is that the court records for evictions data do not have any demographic information. Um, and so what we're able to do is link the evictions data to um, a survey and decennial census data here and, 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 and connect the race information, gender information, also information on age to be able to, to sort of create these demographic profiles of who is evicted. And this is particularly important to me because with evictions, with incarceration uh, and with the work that I do on social mobility, it is, um, it is such an, the experience is uh, for a lot of minority communities, they are overrepresented in in terms of being filed against an eviction. So they're overrepresented in incarceration. And so to be able to really highlight the stories and disseminate statistics so that the public and policymakers and localities can use these statistics to sort of make hopefully people's lives better is important to me. Well, well thank you. I will say I have learned so much about you know beyond just the decennial census and economic programs but the administrative records um, data that we're that you are creating um, is just amazing and thank you so much for sharing them i'm sure all the links that are put in the chat everyone's going to take a look at those great data products um, so i want to thank our panel for their time um, answering questions um, in our presentation um, i will just entice our audience um, with a session that's happening 
um, on Thursday at 3 o'clock. It's the last of our webinar series. It's called Future Possibilities um, of Administrative Records, a fascinating conversation with some of our leadership. Um, it is at 3 o'clock Eastern time. Um, and that will conclude our um, webinar series. And um, so I hope that you will join us. Thank you so much. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.